Hi and welcome. Before I begin today's story, I would like to warn people that this video contains a storyline that may cause distress. I find it hard to believe that a group of people can get together and carry out such depravity on another human being. Viewer discretion is strongly advised. This story takes place in Manchester, one of the UK's largest cities, located in the northwest of England and has a population of around 3 million people. Manchester is renowned for its industrial heritage, with its 18th century canal system, which once carried the cargo from when the city was the textile capital of the UK. Once the powerhouse of industry, it is now a major cultural hub, famous for its many fantastic nightclubs, extensive libraries and glorious sporting history. Home to the famous Manchester United, who at one point, were probably the best football team in the world, but recently, they don't seem to be doing so well. It was in Manchester, in January 1976, that Suzanne Kappa was born. Suzanne never had a very good childhood, in fact, she was abandoned by everyone who should have taken care of her. Her father walked out before she was born, and her mother Elizabeth, never gave Suzanne the love and support she deserved. When she was in her early teens, her mother married a man named John, although the marriage wouldn't last, and the pair divorced in 1990. It was then, that Suzanne and her sister Michelle, spent time in a local authority care home, after her mother deserted them. Suzanne felt totally abandoned, and all she wanted in life was to be loved by someone. Suzanne and Michelle, soon left the care home, to be in the care of their stepfather John, who agreed to take care of them. Although she still had her stepfather, she began looking for attention and affection from anybody that would give it to her. She began playing hooky from school, and her attendance in her last two years was described as erratic. It was around this time, that Suzanne started staying out overnight, going to parties and taking drugs. She started hanging around the house of Jean Powell, who used to babysit Suzanne, and had known her for around 10 years. The dilapidated house, at 97 Langworthy Road, was a hot spot for drug dealing, parties and sex. Amphetamines would be weighed out on kitchen scales, and stolen car parts would be in all rooms. John tried to stop Suzanne going to Powell's house, but she was strong-willed and went against his wishes. John would later say, if he knew the extent of what went on at Powell's address, he would have tried harder than he did to stop her going. There were six people who mainly frequented the house, and to be honest, it sounds like one big gangbang. The house belonged to Jean Powell, who was 26, she lived there with her three children, and 24-year-old Bernadette McNeely, who also had three children. The regulars at the house were Jean's ex-husband, Glenn Powell, who she was still sleeping with. Jean's present boyfriend, Jeffrey Lee, then there was Bernadette's 16-year-old boyfriend, Anthony Dodson, who again was having sexual relations with Jean and Suzanne. And finally Clifford Pook, who was Jean's younger brother, who at one point, was Suzanne's boyfriend. Sounds like Jean was getting it from all angles, there was only her brother that she wasn't sleeping with, and she also shared a bed with Bernadette. Suzanne would often tell her sister Michelle about how the people in the house bullied her, but she kept going back to get the attention that she craved. Michelle had once lived with Jean Powell, but had moved out in August 1992, because she did not like the evil new friends Powell was associating with, particularly Bernadette McNeely, who had recently moved in three doors away, at number 91. After Michelle moved out, McNeely decided to move in. And between the two of them, they had six kids. The two shared a bed in the downstairs dining room, because the bedrooms were full of children. Michelle recalls how her sister never seemed scared of anyone from the house, but would often let them take advantage of her. She also remembers how her sister came to her mother's home in late autumn, after being beaten up by Powell, and begged her mother to let her stay overnight. Her mother cruelly turned her daughter away, saying that her new boyfriend would not like it, leaving Suzanne no choice but to go back to the gang's house. Things quickly went from bad to worse for Suzanne, in early December 1992, when the gang accused her of stealing a pink duffel coat, and infecting the whole of the group with pubic lice. 
Suzanne was having a sexual relationship with Anthony Dodson and Clifford Perk. Dodson was also sleeping with Powell and McNeely, and probably others, so I can't see how they can pinpoint it on Suzanne. Sounds like they were all shagging each other, and they all ended up with crabs, with poor Suzanne taking the blame for it. After the initial confrontation, she went back to her stepdad's house, and it was then, that the gang came to the conclusion, that she needed to be taught a lesson. On the 7th of December 1992, the gang stopped by Suzanne's stepfather's, and told her that a guy that she had a crush on, was at Powell's house wanting to meet her. Unsuspecting Suzanne, fell for the gang's lies, and went with them to the house of evil. Immediately upon reaching the house, Suzanne was held down by the gang, and Glyn Powell shaved her head, also shaving her eyebrows. She was then made to clear up all of her hair, and it was placed in a bin. Glyn then put a plastic bag over her head, and walked around her, punching her in the head when she couldn't see it coming. She was then kicked by Powell and McNeely as she lay curled up on the floor, and both women took turns beating her with a three-foot-long wooden bat and a belt buckle. The beating was so severe, that one of her arms ended up broken. She was then taken to the bathroom, and forced to shave off her own pubic hair, as ritual humiliation, in revenge for having caused Dudson and McNeely themselves to be shaved. After the gang had finished with her, they took her upstairs, and locked her up in a cold dark cupboard for the night. The next morning, she was brought downstairs, and locked in another cupboard before being moved to Bernadette McNeely's old house, three doors along. The gang were concerned, that Suzanne's cries and screams were so loud, they could wake and disturb Powell's and McNeely's six children that lived there. Her mouth was stuffed with a pair of socks, and she was tied spread eagle to an upturned bed with electrical flex, in a downstairs back room. Over the next five days, Suzanne was subjected to a series of violent acts, which increased in severity and brutality as the time passed. She was injected with amphetamines, and burned with cigarettes on her hands, body and face. Throughout the whole five days, a pair of earphones was put on Suzanne, and the same song was repeated at full volume in her ears, over and over again. Being tied to the bed, and unable to use the toilet, Suzanne had been lying in her own urine and feces for days, and the stench became unbearable. She was placed in a bath containing concentrated disinfectant, and scrubbed with a stiff brush with sufficient force to remove her skin. It was then, that Clifford Cook got a pair of pliers and pulled two of her teeth out, then snapped another, leaving the nerve hanging. All the while, the group stood laughing as he did this to her. Her teeth, were later found at Clifford's home, collected as a macabre trophy from her torture. There was one opportunity to get help for Suzanne, as a friend of the gang, 18-year-old David Hill, was asked to watch the house, while the others went out. They showed Suzanne to David, tied up, battered and bruised, then the gang went out and he was left alone with her, but claims he was too scared of them to do anything. He thought they would come after him next, so said nothing. You could call him a wimp, but I suppose being only 18 year old, and seeing such a sight, I can imagine it being quite intimidating and frightening. Jeffrey Lee and Anthony Dudson, even went to help fix Suzanne's sister Michelle's car, whilst all the time having her sister tied up in the house. Upon hearing from Michelle, that the family were about to report Suzanne to the police as a missing person, the gang agreed that she had to be moved from the house. In the early hours of the 14th of December 1992, Suzanne was forced into the boot of a stolen white Fiat Panda car, and driven 15 miles to a narrow lane at Werneth Low, near Romilly, on the outskirts of Stockport. In the car, were Jean and Glyn Powell, Bernadette McNeely, and Anthony Dodson. Powell later said, that Suzanne was pushed down an embankment, into a patch of brambles, where McNeely poured petrol all over her. When McNeely had difficulty getting the petrol to ignite, Glyn Powell and Dudson made multiple attempts before finally lighting the girl's body on fire. As she writhed in agony from being burned alive, McNeely just laughed, and sang aloud the song, Burn Baby Burn. Thinking Suzanne was dead, the group returned to Jean Powell's house, stopping to buy alcohol on the way, both Clifford Puck and Jeffrey Lee were at the house when they arrived back. After the attackers left, she managed to scramble back up the embankment, and stagger along the lane for approximately a quarter of a mile to Compstall Road, 
despite having extensive burns. After five days of torture, and being burned alive. How this poor girl found the strength to get up and try to find help is astonishing. She was found at 6.10 a.m. by three men driving past on their way to work. They immediately took her to a nearby house, which was owned by Michael and Margaret Coop. They called for an ambulance and tried to help with all of her wounds. Michael Coop said, her legs were just like raw meat, and her feet appeared to be badly charred. I was struck on the politeness of the victim, she was constantly thanking my wife for her assistance. Margaret Coop said, I instinctively went to put my arms around her, but she pulled away, because she could not bear to be touched. Her head was shaved, and there were recent cuts to her head and body. Her face was almost featureless, her hands were red raw and black at the fingertips, her legs were red from top to bottom and she couldn't bear anything to be touching them. Suzanne was rushed to hospital, and was able to tell police the names of her six attackers, before slipping into a coma. The extent of her burns was such that her mother and stepfather were unable to recognize her, and she was positively identified by a partial fingerprint from her thumb, the only part of her hands not severely burned. On the 18th of December 1992, Suzanne would sadly pass away without regaining consciousness, she had burns to 80% of her body. Dr. William Lawler had said, it was clear from the outset that Suzanne was unlikely to survive, she suffered superficial but widespread burns, that led to several complications internally, there was also a partial collapse in one of her lungs. When police arrived at 97 Langworthy Road, they were met by a complete and utter shithole. They were lucky they never caught crabs while they searched the place. The living room was covered with rubbish, and they had stolen car seats instead of sofas. They found Suzanne's hair in the bin, and a pair of bloody pliers, used to pull out her teeth. The two girls, Powell and McNeely, reportedly laughed and joked when they were both arrested. Initially, all six denied any involvement, but Dudson, who was urged to tell the truth by his father, soon began to tell detectives what really happened. As the truth came out, police couldn't believe what this poor girl had endured. Even hardened police officers wept, as the extent of Suzanne's suffering was uncovered. On the 17th of December 1992, the six accused, appeared before magistrates in Manchester, and were remanded into custody, charged with kidnapping and attempted murder. And following her death, they were charged with murder a week later, on the 23rd of December. The trial commenced on the 16th of November 1993, at Manchester Crown Court, and lasted 22 days. All six of the defendants, tried to minimize the role they played in the crime. However, with having Suzanne's dying statement, the six were all found guilty to the part they played in her death. Judge Francis Potts called it a barbaric and appalling murder, and one of the most harrowing cases he has dealt with. Jeffrey Lee was acquitted of murder and conspiracy to commit grievous bodily harm, but was convicted of false imprisonment and sentenced to 12 years. Clifford Pook was also acquitted of murder but pleaded guilty to conspiracy to commit grievous bodily harm and false imprisonment, he was sentenced to 15 years. Anthony Dudson was found guilty of murder, and must serve at least 18 years before being considered for parole. Jean and Glyn Powell and Bernadette McNeely, were all found guilty of murder, and sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of 25 years. After the sentences were read out, two of the jurors wept. And there were shouts of yes 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 from the public gallery, which was filled with relatives of the victim. While none of the six attackers should ever see the light of day, only Jean and Glyn Powell, and Anthony Dodson remain behind bars today. Jean Powell's sentence was reduced by two years, after she allegedly showed remorse, and helped prevent a prison escape. Bernadette McNeely, made the headlines again, when she had a fling with the infamous Moore's murderer, and child killer Myra Hindley. The pair of sick bitches struck up a romance while they were in Durham prison together. After this, she was moved out of Durham prison, after it came to light that she was having an affair with the prison governor. I wonder if she gave any of them crabs. I guess it worked in her favor though, because she was released before the other three who are still in jail. Clifford Puck and Jeffrey Lee have also been released, the whereabouts of all three are unknown. In my opinion. They should still be in jail.
Our society never ceases to amaze me with cases like this, it's rare when just one person can treat another this badly, but when there are six people, and not one of them shows the slightest bit of compassion for the victim, it's just unbelievable. Sometimes a life sentence should mean life in prison. I hope you enjoyed the video, you can subscribe if you're into true crime, as we post videos weekly.